Hello, my name is Sino Agueze and I'm the founding president of Transformations of Nations. And I'm so excited to be in your home or your place of work or business or wherever you may be at this moment watching this broadcast. Boy, do I have a message that will transform your life. So you want to get on the phone or text up somebody and let them know we are, we are on the air right now. And I believe that there's no way your life is going to be the same. In the uh, two previous broadcasts, we began a new series called uh, The Great Commission Defined. We wanted to explain what the Great Commission was from the traditional perspective of view that most people had. You know, for years, people thought that when Jesus said, go ye into the world and make disciples of nations, that he was talking about soul winning, or he was talking about handing out tracts, or he was talking about hosting mass crusades across the country. But the Great Commission, even though it includes all of that, there is a fuller meaning. Uh, uh, the depth and the breadth of the Great Commission is bigger than all of that. So we began by talking about the four definitions of the Great Commission. And what I want to do is put that again on the screen so you can see it, uh, to just give you a, a brief summary of what we talked about. Number one, the Great Commission is the commandment to disciple nations of the earth. Which means that the Great Commission is not about discipling people, but it is about discipling the nations of the earth. Number two, we talked about how the Great Commission is establishing the reign of Christ in every nook and corner and strata of society. In other words, when we look at your nation, your entire nation needs to be saturated with the glory and the value systems of the kingdom of God. Number three, we talked about how the Great Commission is the art of displacing and replacing value systems. And number four, we talked about how the Great Commission is the transformation of the soul of a man, but also the transformation of his environment. So it's not enough just to win people to Christ. We have to understand how to redeem the earth back to God, how to redeem nations back to God, how to redeem a society, how to redeem a community of people back to God. And that's what the Great Commission is all about. But today we want to go into something slightly different. I want to talk about why did Jesus give us the Great Commission? Why did Jesus tell us in Matthew chapter number 28 and verses 19, Go ye into all the world and make disciples of nations. You know, every time Jesus speaks, there's always a debt to every one of his words. And this is the most important individual as well as corporate assignment that he gave to the body of Christ before he left this earth. Which means there's got to be more to the meaning of the Great Commission than the eyes would naturally see. So I want to explain why did Jesus give us the Great Commission? In other words, why did Jesus tell us to go and make disciples of nations? There is a reason why Jesus gave us that instruction. And there is a reason why Jesus gave to the church, the body of Christ, that awesome and wonderful commandment to go into all the world and make disciples of nations. Now, so I want to get into it. In the epistle of 1 John, the epistle of 1 John, chapter number 5, the epistle of 1 John, chapter number 5, we see how Jesus explains to us why he gave us this commission. In 1 John, chapter number 5, we're looking at verses 19, verses 19, and it says here, in verses 19, it says, we know that we are of God and the whole world. Lie it in wickedness. I want to say that again. We know that we are of God, but the whole world, that word world means the cosmos. The cosmos lie it under the wicked one. The Amplified Translation says we know positively that we are of God and the whole world around us is under the power of the evil one. The cosmos is under the power of the evil one. And when it talks about the cosmos, like I said in the previous broadcast, I'm talking about the seven structures on which every nation is built and established. In order to successfully transform a nation, the seven structures on which any nation is built has to be transformed. And those seven structures, I gave it to you in the previous broadcast, but just go again and look at it on your screen. We're talking about government. We're talking about business. We're talking about education. We're talking about the mass media. We're talking about arts, entertainment, and sports. We're talking about religion, and we're also talking about the family structure. These seven structures must be transformed in order to transform your nation. That's why a nation, nations like in Africa, you have, you have a, a true move of God, a, a move of the Holy Spirit. You have mega churches on every block, yet 
There is systemic poverty. There is systemic corruption. Uh, and the common average man and woman is suffering at an epidemic rate. Why? Because even though we are preaching the gospel of salvation, we are not including the message of the Great Commission, which is the gospel of the kingdom. Yet Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, that the gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world as a witness unto all the nations, and only then will the end come. So if we have to be successful in transforming the third world nations of the world or any nation on the planet, we must understand the depth and the breadth of the Great Commission, which is transforming those seven structures on which every nation is established. So the Bible is telling us that the whole cosmos lieth under the power of the wicked one. So Satan understands that in order to control a nation, you must control her gates. You must control the seven structures on which every nation is established. This is very powerful. Because you see, he who controls the seven structures controls the nation. When somebody controls the government and controls uh, uh, e economics, the business world, and controls the education, and controls the mass media, they control the nation. So Satan understands that principle. And he takes whole nations in, in, in the captivity of his own power because he understands the importance of controlling those gates. So we have to understand, that's why Jesus told us, go and make disciples of nations. In other words, go and transform those seven structures. So Satan controls the cosmos, the whole world, lie it under the power of the wicked one. Now, in Revelation chapter 17, in Revelation chapter number 17, we see how, if we look at verses 1, I want to go ahead and share the principle with you. Uh, uh, in Revelation chapter 17, we see in verses 1, uh, just flow with me in verses 1, we see how Satan controls these seven structures. So we see in Revelation chapter 17, it says here, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vows, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I'll show unto you the judgment of the great hall that sits upon many waters. So now we are seeing uh, the, the, the symbolic meaning of Revelation 17, 1, where the Word of God says this. It says, Come, and I'll show you the great hall that it's sitting upon many waters. Sitting upon many waters. What are these waters? In verses 15, it says, And he said unto me, The waters which you saw where the hall sits are what? They are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So this hall, which is the spirit of this world, she sits upon the nations, the people, the cosmos. And that word to sit means that she's exercising authority. The word to sit means that she's in a place of control, in a place of power. She sits upon many waters. Now, I want you to look at verses 2. It says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of a fornication. And of course, it's, it's symbolic. It's explaining uh, something of a deeper meaning to you and I. And what it's saying is that, that she has mingled with the kings of the earth. With the kings of the earth. And now I want you to see the consequence of mingling of controlling the kings of the earth. It says, And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication, which means that the citizens in the nation, a people in the nation, are under her spell, under her influence, under her power. How? This is how she goes about it. She knows that if you control the kings, then you control the inhabitants. You control the indigenous citizens of the land. That's how she controls the nation. Control the kings, then you lay hold on the inhabitants of the land. You control the citizens of the land. How? By controlling the men and women of influence. The men and women of greatness. The kings, the presidents, the prime ministers. To control a nation, 
You have to control those in, in positions of power and positions of authority. And I think this is why the Bible says, if the righteous rule, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. But when, when the wicked rule, the land itself mourns. So it's very important that we understand how Satan controls nations. He controls them by controlling the kings, those in positions of power and authority. Now, I want us to see something else in here. In verses 9, it says this, And here is the mind that had wisdom. Here is the mind that had wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So now we're talking about this woman sitting on uh, the, the waters. And the waters are the nations, the tribes, the people, the tongues. Yet it says that this nation is broken up into seven heads. And those seven heads are the heads that I explained to you. The head of government, the mountain of government. These are institutions. These are mountainous institutions that exist upon which nations and societies are built and established. We have government, we have business, we have education, we have the mass media, we have arts, entertainment and sports, we have uh, the, the structure, the religious structure, and we have the family structure. These seven heads, the Bible says this woman sits upon them to exercise control, to exercise authority. She controls the nations by controlling her seven pillars, her seven structures. This is very, very powerful that you and I understand this. See, very, very powerful. Let's see what the Amplified says. Let's see what the Amplified says. The Amplified says in Revelation chapter number 17 and verses 9. And it says, this calls for a mind to consider that which is packed with wisdom and intelligence. It is something for a particular mode of thinking and the judging of thoughts, feelings, and purposes. The seven heads are seven heels upon which the woman sits. Seven heels upon which the woman is seated. So these seven heels are the seven structures on which every nation is built. For example, you go to nations like Armenia, where almost 90% of the people are claimed to be Christians. Or you go into a nation like Guatemala, where, where out of every two people, one person is born again. Yet, you have systemic corruption, you have systemic poverty, you have crime at epidemic levels. Why is this? You have the salvation of a soul, but the nation lacks transformation. The nation lacks the value systems of the kingdom of God. You see, the Great Commission includes both the salvation of a man's soul and the redemption or the salvation of his environment, of his land. There is a reason why when God created Adam in Genesis chapter number 1, that in Genesis chapter number 2, he created the right environment and placed man in the Garden of Eden, so that when Adam fell, he was banished from the Garden of Eden. Why? Because his assignment was to duplicate the Garden of Eden all around the globe, all around the world. In other words, to reproduce the Garden of Eden in every nook and corner of the earth, so that the kingdoms of this world can become the kingdoms of our Christ and of our God. So it's very important that until we understand this concept, the transformation in nations like Africa will, be not, it will not be seen. You know, every time when I visit African nations, I, I see people praying, Oh God, change, change the nation. Oh God, we are tired of the crime, we are tired of the corruption, we are tired of the poverty, we are tired, we are tired. Well, how are you going to transform it? It's not just through prayer. Prayer is not sufficient to transform a nation. We've got to raise people to enter into these structures and bring transformation. Nations like Singapore, that it's predominantly really not a Christian nation. All the things we are praying for in the African nations, you find them in Singapore. And nobody prayed about it. Why? Because they are operating on different laws and levels of knowledge and understanding. And it's time for you and I to lay hold on the meaning of the Great Commission.